mess up your heart, just, just take a second and just say, Holy Spirit, examine me right now. What have I picked up? And then if you will, just lay it down. Lay it down. That unforgiveness. That anger you have towards whatever. And just say, Lord, it's yours. I picked it up. I don't want this anymore because it's not doing me any good. And you paid for it, so you own it. You own it, Jesus. Father, these men are here because they want to hear from you. And they are right now. Some of I can see it on some of them right now. That burden, that weight, that thing. Release it in the name of Jesus. Release it in the name of Jesus. We praise you and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Man. He just made my job really, really easy. Both of you guys, thank you. <laughs> well, good morning. Uh, if you're looking for Neil, I'm not him, obviously. Uh, my name is Michael Perrin. Uh, it's an honor to be back with you to lead this men's Bible study on Friday mornings. Uh, I have the responsibility um, to oversee a ministry that we have called Life Recovery. And the Life Recovery ministry is designed to help people Recover the life that Christ intended. Yes, it deals with uh, addictions of all types, but it also deals with the things that we just mentioned. Bitterness, anxiety, fear, loneliness, worry, grief. Uh, our family is going through grief right now. Just to let you into a, a little bit of my story, we had to put our dog Dolce down yesterday. 15 years and nine months this dog has been with us. Uh, we call her our brain tumor dog. Some of you know the story, but our son was diagnosed with a brain tumor at the age of seven. We had purchased Dolce about four weeks before that. And so she was the dog that walked our family through that event. Uh, by the way, he is absolutely fine right now. He is married, 23 years old. He is a graduate of OU. Sooner, yeah. And he is currently serving as a uh, munitions officer in the United States Navy out of Norfolk, Virginia. So, all that to say, I had to lay, lay that grief down. I had to put into practice, what does Jesus say? Physician, surely you will quote this proverb, physician heal thyself. Ugh, I need some healing this morning because our, uh, our family is missing Dolce. Listen, take your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to just jump right in. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, taking an examination and a deeper dive into leadership. Leadership, authority, those two things kind of move together with one another. And in this familiar passage, maybe to some of you, the temptation of Jesus, we pick up right away on these character traits of leadership. I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Here we go. It says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. That's the understatement of the year. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God... Command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, 
For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. I was asked to come in this morning and talk about what is the greatest temptation that leaders, kingdom leaders, men in particular, to their authority? What's the greatest temptation that tends to lead people away from their kingdom calling, their God-given anointing to be leaders for the kingdom of God? And the greatest temptation of a leader in the kingdom of God is to find their identity from anything other than what the Father has said. And what does the Father say? You're beloved. You see, the Father had just given Jesus his identity in the previous chapter. If you go back and read, Jesus comes on the scene, he enters the waters, he's baptized, he rises up, audible voice of the Father speaks and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We find this phrase being spoken of Jesus one other time. Luke chapter 9, during the transfiguration of Jesus, two times the audible voice of the Lord are heard over Jesus' life. Both say the same thing. You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Transfiguration, you are my beloved son. Listen to what he says You see, it was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and getting more towards the twilight of his ministry that the audible voice is spoken. You are my beloved son. The first time the father speaks of Jesus' identity as a beloved son, he'd done nothing. No accolades, no worldly fame, no followers, no noteworthy accomplishments, nothing. As far as the world would see, the message is, You're my beloved son. Now, on the transfiguration, second time he says it, Jesus had done some stuff. Read the next chapters. He had followers. He had a reputation that was spreading across the countryside. And he had performed miracles. I mean, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, delivering demons, all that stuff he had done. But when the father spoke over Jesus' life the second time, He did not praise his accolades. He did not say, this is my beloved son because he's done this and that. And man, did you see what he did to that demon the other day? None of that was entered into the equation. No, the father said the very same thing that he said about Jesus when he had done nothing and when he was doing everything. The message is this, you're my beloved son. I'm pleased in you. What's the point? The point is this, those with kingdom authority are settled in their beloved identity as a son of their heavenly father. Because no sooner had these words been spoken over Jesus' life that the spirit led him into the wilderness. Note this, the spirit led him into the wilderness, not the devil. Holy Spirit's leading is not always to comfort and ease. Holy Spirit leads you into places in which confidence is established. Confidence is established. Just kind of a side note on this. I've heard it said that when you do something great for God, what should you do? Get ready because the devil is coming after you. Nonsense. Nonsense. Jesus had done nothing at the beginning of his ministry. Nothing great for God. And yet, what happened to him? He was tempted by the devil. On the other side of it, Jesus had done all these amazing things, comes down off the mountain, and instead of the devil being after him, the first thing he does when he comes off the mountain, guys, is he walks up to a a father who has a boy who's demonized, and he delivers a demon out of that kid. You see, doing something great for God does not come with a target on your back. No, don't don't believe that lie. By the way, why would you ever want to do anything great for God if you're just setting yourself up to be punished? I mean, think about this for just a minute. Biblically speaking, all right, 
let's kind of do away with that thing. That was, that was free. Okay, you got that one for free. Okay. The greatest temptation of a leader in the kingdom is to find their identity from anything other than what the Father said. You know, in the specific temptations that we have from Satan, three ways in which many imagine they can find an identity. The first one is this. Here are the lies. I can find an identity in doing something noteworthy or miraculous. That's where you find your identity. That's a lie. What does the devil say? If you are the son of God, change this stone into bread. I mean, if Jesus would have done that, that would have been pretty noteworthy. I mean, imagine flipping through like 40 resumes, you know, and they have all these qualifications and everything. And one of the side things is, I changed rocks into bread. I mean, that would at least get a second call, right? That's pretty noteworthy stuff. But Jesus understood that doing something noteworthy or miraculous is not kingdom leadership. And it's not a place in which you can find an enduring, beloved identity. Actually, Jesus said this, those who look for miracles to determine the worthiness of a leader are evil and unfaithful. That if you want, Matthew 16, 4, in case you want to write that down. So when you look and try to do something noteworthy, something miraculous, something big in order to receive leadership and authority, you're putting your ladder up against a burning building that's falling down because Jesus does not look for that. That is not a sign of kingdom leadership. Praise from the world for noteworthy accomplishments is not kingdom leadership. However, praise by those who know them best is. For those of you who are married, show me your wife. Show me your spouse. And I'll see right away if you're a leader in the kingdom of God. Because two are one. And so when I look at her, I'm actually looking at you, the Bible implies. And so how is your wife? How does she respond? How do you care? How do you nourish? How do you cherish? How do you wash her by the water of the word? How do you die to self? It'll be evident by her because that is a noteworthy accomplishment in my book just by looking at your wife and her countenance. The other aspect of that is if you're not married, how do children interact with you? Jesus says, let the little children come unto me, right? The implication there is kids wanted to be around Jesus. So it's not the big noteworthy, miraculous things that you should look for in kingdom leaders. No, how how does their, what's their wife? Show me your wife and show me how children interact with you. And I'll discover pretty much kind of all I need to know as far as your authority and your kingdom leadership. What does Jesus say again? Let the little children Come unto me. You see, again, doing something noteworthy is not kingdom leadership. However, being confident in the truth is. Being confident in the truth is. What's the truth? You are my beloved son. You are the father's beloved son. And you're thinking, I'm not Jesus. Well, you need to tell that to scripture because 1 John 4, 7 says, as Jesus is, so are we in the world. So if the Father says that Jesus is my beloved Son, 1 John reminds us that as Jesus is, so are we in the world. The implication, again, is we are the beloved sons of the Father. We're not Jesus. Don't get me wrong, okay? But we are the beloved sons of the Father. Colossians 3.12, we are holy and beloved, the Bible says, Because being confident in your beloved identity, as far as a leader is concerned, removes this this desperation that we can find ourselves in to do something noteworthy. If I just do something great, people will recognize me. If I just do something great, somebody will give me attention. No, that's a desperation because God does not respond to desperation. He responds to confidence in the truth. That's the first step of kingdom leadership. Don't do something huge and noteworthy out in the public where everybody can see. Don't change stones into bread. Instead, how do the people around you treat you? How do they respond? And don't be desperate. Be faithful. Be confident in where the Lord has put you. All right. Second, 
lie that leaders have is this. I can be a leader and find an identity by being successful in Babylon. You see, worldly success or position is not kingdom leadership, and it will not provide you, as I said, the identity that's unshakable. Commitment to truth does. The temptation from Satan to find an identity is for him to give Jesus authority over the kingdoms of the world. He says it. I will give you all authority over the kingdoms of the world. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, guys. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see what he's trying to do. He basically says, bow to me, and I'll give you all the authority you want in Babylon. I'll give you all the praise. I'll give you anything you need. I'll give you an identity, Satan is saying, that's based on numbers, that's based on accounts, and that's based on comparison to them. You see, that's what being successful in Babylon really amounts to. I'm accountable. I'm looking at my identity, and that identity is based on you, as opposed to my identity being based on what the Father says. And that is a scrambled egg. I mean, you're just scrambling around. Desperation kicks in again. If you've been captured by this lie of success, of having more than them, uh, it's bondage. Because the problem in using that mindset is that you will create an identity that has a poverty mindset. You'll walk around maybe rich in the world, but you are in poverty internally. Because like a forest fire, hell, a barren woman, and parched land, Proverbs says, you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied. If you find an identity, if you, if you try to be a leader based upon success in Babylon, and that's your litmus, that's the, that's the baseline, you will never be satisfied. Because God defines success as obedience. The obedience and faithfulness to what he has asked you to do. What did Jesus ask us to do? Pretty much two things, a couple more, I mean, obviously. Love him, love others, including yourself, by the way. Because if I don't love myself, I'm incapable of loving you. Can't do it. Leadership begins with self. And again, if I don't lead myself by finding an identity in what God has said, Despite my place in Babylon, I'll never be able to lead you. You know, um, I debated talking, saying this, but I think it's necessary. You know, it, it amazes me, sometimes, sometimes perplexes me, um, why in kingdom environments, you know, the, the, the kingdom of God environments, a lot of times we look for people that are a su success in Babylon, and we use that as something to place them in leadership within the church itself. Now listen, I'm not, hear me, hear me, I'm not saying don't be successful in Babylon, okay? And I'm not saying that people who are successful in the world are not called to be kingdom leaders within the church. But what I am saying is success in Babylon should not ever be considered when choosing leaders. Why do I say that? What did Jesus demonstrate? He did not look at any worldly success of these men. He called into his discipleship. No, he looked at their heart, and here's what he asked them. Are you willing to follow me? That should be the thing we look for in raising people up, giving them authority, putting them in a leadership position. Yes, they may be successful in Babylon, but that is not what we're looking for. We're looking for a willingness to follow after Jesus. And over the course of the week, you know, my ministry is an adventure, guys. It really is. Um, I will get calls all the time. Hey, I need some help with this. Hey, can you help me with this? Hey, this is going on. Hey, do you have any insight on maybe all of this stuff? I need help is what they're saying. My first question is this. Are you or do you believe there is hope for a life of wholeness? Most of the time they say yes. And the second question is, is, what are you willing to do? 
Because unless we establish that, I'm just giving you a lot of great information. But if you're not willing to follow Jesus, if you're not willing to do nearly anything, we're just wasting our time. Until there's a willingness to do anything, your beloved identity as a son of the Father can be elusive. It would be difficult to find. Jesus always required buy-in from the people he helped. Go back and look through the scriptures. Go back and look at the ministry of Jesus. Every person that came to him, Jesus required a buy-in. The woman with the issue of blood, what was her buy-in? She went to Jesus. Okay, The lepers, what was, what was their buy-in? They cried out and asked for help. I mean, the one guy that is a little interesting is the blind Bartimaeus. Remember this story, blind Bartimaeus sitting on the side of the road, can't see, obviously. Jesus comes over to him, bends down, puts mud on his eyes. The guy stands up, and Jesus says to him, by the way, he didn't know it was Jesus. So he didn't come to Jesus. You, know, you with me? So he stands up, and Jesus says this to him, hey, go wash yourself off in the pool of Siloam, and and." Didn't tell him what was going to happen. What was that man's buy-in? He had to make his way to the pool of Siloam. And in confidence and in faith, washed himself off and was healed. See, God, Jesus, requires buy-in. What does that mean? He requires that we are committed to the truth of what he says. Leaders are committed, okay? It's not necessarily an identity that Babylon is going to give you. No, an inner personal commitment to truth is what raises up authority and what raises up leaders. You may be in bondage right now. There may be addiction, fear, loneliness, all that stuff going on. I'm going to ask you two questions. Do you believe that there is hope for a life of wholeness? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? Kingdom leaders don't determine their identity by being successful in Babylon They're confident in their beloved identity, and they are committed to the truth. And the last one is this. I can find a beloved identity from other people. You're going to have to, we dig into this one just a little bit. What does the Satan say to Jesus? Throw yourself down from here. Now, just back it up a little bit. Where were they? Well, they were at the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. The highest point, let's say. People everywhere around the city, you would surely notice someone standing at the pinnacle of the temple, okay? And what is being, in, being said here is this, hey, Jesus, do something great in front of all these people. Let them see how amazing you are, and they will give you they're, they will allow you to have authority over them, and they will allow you to be a leader over them. Because we can't find our identity as leaders from other people. If I say the name to you, Dennis Eldridge, I don't think anybody in this room is thinking, man, he is a great man of God. What a powerful, anointed guy. Why do I say that? Because none of you know this guy's name. To me, he's the greatest man I know. Why do I say that? Because for seven years, Dennis Eldridge met me at Bix Restaurant over by Addison. Anybody ever been to Bix? Okay, a little testimony on that. Bix Restaurant over near Addison Airport, 6 o'clock in the morning for seven years every Tuesday. A barely sober, trying to find his way back to life. Father and husband, and he poured his life into me every Tuesday morning. Dennis Eldridge is the greatest, one of the greatest men of God that I know because he cared for me. He cared. He has authority over my life. I love being here this morning, but I promise you this. If Dennis Eldridge happened to call me right now and said, Michael, I need to see you, I would say, hasta, see you later, guys. And I would, <laughs> I would drive two hours to see him. Why? Because that's how much authority he has in my life. Did he demand it? No. 
Did he say you needed to yield to me and submit to me? Absolutely not. No, I gave him that authority. Why? Because he cares for me. He cares for me. And the beautiful part about having a Dennis Eldridge in my life is my wife Christina has him too. <laughs> okay? Because if I were to go out and the spirit of stupid were to jump on me, you with me? All right. Christina would not confront me. Dennis Eldridge would confront me. Because Christina would pick up the phone, call Dennis Eldridge and say, hey, uh, and Dennis was like, I'll be right there. I'll be right there. And because he has authority, because he loved me, because he cared for me, I'm going to listen to that man. Accolades do not give you authority, guys. Care does. I mean, the Apostle Paul did not know he was writing Scripture when he was writing. He was writing letters to people that he cared for. Think about that. You see, our, often our greatest things we do for God and the kingdom as leaders and those in authority seem really insignificant at the moment. But we do them anyway. Other people will not give you a beloved identity. Christ did. So, wrapping this up. Kingdom leaders are not recognized by their success in Babylon. They are recognized for their commitment to truth. Those with authority in the kingdom of God do not receive it because of their accolades or public recognition. They receive it because they care for others. And I'll leave you with this real quick. Authority. I'm going to break this thing down for you really, really fast. I think. Maybe. There we go. Authority. You notice the word authority up there, and you notice that I've highlighted some letters because there's another word in the word authority, and it's author. As a matter of fact, the root word is from the Latin octor, the Latin word for authority, and here's what it means. It means a promoter, a builder, a historian, a teacher, and a father. That's what the word authority means. Its literal meaning is one who causes something to grow. So far from a position that we would think authority, general, president, manager, boss, that's not it at all. Authority carries, carries with it this idea of a gardener, hands in the dirt, kneeling down, helping other things grow. That's how you get authority in the kingdom. That's how you become a leader in the kingdom of God. He's not detached. The father is not detached. He's not a dictator. And when we live as children of this father and we're confident in our identity, we experience freedom. Why? Because my role in someone's life, if they have chosen to allow me to have authority in their life, is not to tell them what to do. My role is to help them write their story. This morning when you came in, I asked the guys to put pens on the tables. I want every one of you to pick up that, a pen. Just find a pen. Maybe it's yours, maybe it's not, whatever it happens to be. Now here's what I want you to do with that pen. If you have a son, spiritual son, Next time you see him, I want you to hand him that pen. And I want you to look him in the eye and I want you to tell them this. Hey, I just want to remind you that I'm not here to write your story for you. But I'm going to help you write yours. And just hand him the pen. If you don't have anybody like that, if you don't have somebody you're discipling right now, you just keep it in your pocket. Put it, some, put it someplace where you see it, maybe in your car, whatever it happens to be. And every time you look at that, my prayer is the Holy Spirit's going to say, where is your spiritual son? Who are you helping write your story? Write their story, excuse me. In addition to that, guys, do you have somebody that's helping you write yours? Do you have a father, if you will, in the faith? Because if you don't, 
you could take that pen and you could walk up to somebody and you can say, will you help me write my story? Things are okay right now, but I know there's more. Things are not good right now. I need an, another chapter. I need another book for some of us. But I just need somebody to help write a story. Because people in authority, that's what they do. They're authors. So this morning around the tables, I just want you to talk about that a little bit. Do you have a son, if you will, a spiritual son that you're helping write their story? Talk about that. Do you have Dennis Eldridge? Do you have a Dennis Eldridge? Somebody who is helping you write your story in the midst of all of that. And by the way, by the way, guys, if you're waiting around for somebody to come to you, you're going to be waiting a long time. Why do I say that? How did Jesus call his disciples? He went to them. Find that young man. I say young. It doesn't have to be an age. You go to them and say, look, do you have anybody helping you write your story right now? I'd, I'd value the opportunity to sit with you and help you write yours. Because by doing that, you're going to change the world. You're going to change the world. True leadership is not achieved. True leadership is received. Worldly men have faith in their work. Kingdom men work out their faith. Worldly men cause others to know their methods. Kingdom men cause others to know their God. The success of worldly men can be defined in certain observable methods, methods that can be cataloged, emulated, and sold for profit. The success of kingdom men is attributed to one thing only, obedience to the spoken word of Yahweh. While that obedience may be manifested in observable acts, emulation of those acts by others will never bring the hope for success. Therefore, kingdom man success does not produce much in the way of a product that can be marketed at great prices, bringing great wealth to the man in the world. But the kingdom man's success does not cause glory to come to him, but to Yahweh. Worldly men base their success upon notoriety, worldly authority, and popularity. Kingdom men know that their success is based upon uncompromised obedience to Yahweh. True revelation is biting, sharp, provocative, challenging, and ever-present help to the status quo. Therefore, Kingdom men are almost always misunderstood, lonely, rejected in their time, most often remaining a voice crying in the desert. They may be recognized, honored, and revered, but never in their generation. And yet, they fan the flame and hold the stories of the futures Moses's, John the Baptist's, Paul's, and yes, even the Christ. Guys, go help others write their story. The world needs it. The world needs it. They need you, men. And if you need a man, go ask him. Go ask him. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, you have told us in your word that we find an identity just because of you, and we're beloved, beloved. It's not our accolades, it's not our performance, it's not the miracles that we do, it's not the tremendous accomplishments that we have, it's not the degrees on our wall, it's not how many times we've spoken in front of large groups, no, Lord, it is because you said it. Whether we've done nothing great, like Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, or we have accomplished all things in the world, the message is still the same. You are my beloved son. God, I pray for these men here this morning, the young men, the ones that are more advanced in their years. And God, I ask right now in the power of your spirit, let them find someone 
to help either write their story or help another write theirs. Because God, that is true kingdom leadership. You've given us your authority, Jesus. May we use it wisely so that the future, the generations will say, thank you. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.